Good. Uh, shalom l'kulam um, from Eugene, Oregon. It's a great honor for me to uh, be invited by the National Library and to share some of my um, research with you. So let's see if we can make this work. Uh, double click, let's share. Okay, not working, but we'll manage. Okay, on May 26th, let me just see if I can make this go. I never can. No. Sorry. Um, just open it in advance. Yes. And then click on share screen and double click it from the menu that opens up. Okay. Um, shared screen is where? On the, <laughs> Sorry. on the bottom, the green button with the arrow pointing up. Ah, oh, got it, of course. All right. And then double click. Try one more time. No, that, that's fine. You're sharing. Um, just uh, mm -hmm. enlarge the the uh, presentation from the chalice near the slide at the bottom with the plus and minus. There you go. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on May 26, 1171, more than 30 Jewish women and men were murdered in a public burning in Blois, France, at the order of the city's ruler, Count Thibault V. The Jews who lived in Blois under a, char a charter of protection were accused of murdering a Christian boy, although there was neither a recovered corpse nor a missing child. Most of the adult Jews of Blois supported themselves through money lending. And one woman in particular was a prominent lender to the Count and his court. As historian Robert Chazen has written, given the stature of the count, his decision to burn these Jews at the stake represented a potentially disastrous blow to North European Jewry in its entirety, a powerful reinforcement for the growing popular sense of the Jews as internal enemies lodged within Christian society. Today, I will share with you the complicated background of this incident with a focus on Pochalina, the woman who may have been at its center. And I will also discuss the ways in which literary and social suppositions have transformed how she has been represented in various Jewish texts over time. My interest in this topic begins with my interest in medieval Jewish women and my endeavor to discover more about the few Jewish women who are mentioned by name in the annals of medieval Ashkenaz. As I will share with you, my quest became increasingly difficult and progressively more opaque. And a final word before I begin, I have been highly dependent in my research on the detailed and excellent work of the historians and literary scholars, my predecessors on this topic, particularly professors Robert Chazen and Susan Einbinder. In the years before 800 Common Era, small numbers of Jews moved from Italy into and throughout Northern Europe to territories that today are France and Germany. After 1066, small Jewish communities were also established in England. These Jews were attracted by economic opportunities for merchants with international contacts, and they helped to establish small urban communities in an essentially agricultural feudal society. The beginnings of towns, particularly at ports or other commercial and ecclesiastical centers, created the growth of a proto-middle class outside the bonds of the feudal system. Jews exemplified this social change. As city dwellers, as city dwellers dealing in goods, they were outside the hierarchical feudal pyramid. Socially, they constituted a separate corporate unit 
belonging directly to the ruler. Thus, they were often known as the king's persons. The position of these Jewish urban enclaves was assured by charter, a treaty with the ruling power. This person was usually secular, but could also be ecclesiastical in the case of a cathedral city overseen by a bishop. And here on the map, here is Blois, uh, which we'll be centering on the city of Troyes of Orleans will play a major role. Also Troyes, Sans to some extent, and the center of Jewish life in France, such as it was in those days in Paris. Jews were granted charters that spelled out their rights of settlement and protection and other privileges in return for paying substantial taxes. Jews were valued because of their economic usefulness to the ruling powers, but they had no inherent rights and they could be expelled when they were no longer perceived as beneficial. In most instances, when official protection of Jews failed, however, some special circumstance was usually the cause such as the transnational movement of the Crusades beginning in 1096 or the 14th century bubonic plague pandemic. Uh, here we see a, uh, an illustration from 1340, uh, a German uh, text of the Emperor Henry VII after his coronation at Aachen, affirming the privileges of the Jews in the Holy Roman Empire um, with this charter he's handing to a Jew. Uh, the uh, Jew receiving the charter is caricatured with stereotypical Jewish features, a beard, the hooked nose. Interestingly, the other Jews um, with their special hats look no different from the um, other individuals in the, um, in the illustration. The numbers of Jews in any given place tended to be small. They were never more than a few hundred in communities of several thousand people and often significantly fewer, as in the case of Blois, where the Jewish population was around 40. Jews exhibited significant external conformity to their Christian neighbors in terms of language and dress, and many customs, but they were also profoundly other and perceived as such. These differences, of course, included dietary restrictions, which prevented any significant social interaction with Christians, as well as their observance of the Sabbath, Jewish holy days and festivals, ritual domestic observances, and some practices um, within the family. Jews were viewed with suspicion and resentment due to their economic activities and success. And as we can see in this image, they were portrayed negatively by religious authorities, both in word and image. Uh, and especially, as I've said, by the church who saw their very presence as an affront and threat to the truths and triumphs of Christianity. Um, here we see, um, an, again, a medieval illustration of the Jew, uh, marked again by his longer beard, by his special hat, which Jews were required to wear, particularly after the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215. Uh, in conversation with a bishop, we see his curved crozier and uh, two of his churchmen. Church policies established in the sixth century taught that while Jewish lives and property should be protected, their inferiority to Christians must also be evident. And here we see the famous statues from the Strasbourg Cathedral. I saw that we have at least one listener from Strasbourg. These are dated to around 1290. The statues of the Ecclesia, on the left, the triumphant church and uh, the synagogue, the 
portrayed as a woman, interestingly, a weaker, the weaker gender, with a blindfold indicating the Jews' blindness to the truths of Christianity and a broken staff. And we find such statues and images in manuscripts um, throughout Europe in the 13th and 14th century. Um, thus, Jewish prosperity uh, presented a perennial problem for medieval church leaders. As Robert Chasen has pointed out, for the most part, church demands for limitations on Jewish, on Jewish activities had to be executed by the political authorities under whose protection and jurisdiction Jews lived. Thus, church leaders were forced to lobby with secular Christian leaders to achieve their ends. And as we'll see, the Jews had the opportunity to counter lobby as well. Chazen notes that this interplay went on consistently during the Middle Ages. But he goes on to say that while Jews were occasionally successful in their advocacy efforts, the overall power of the church was overwhelming and ecclesiastical demands, even when initially resisted by secular leaders, were usually realized in the long run. Nevertheless, Chazen writes, without exquisite sensitivity to the real world, its economic opportunities and dangers, and its political entanglements, the Jews as an endangered minority community would hardly have been able to survive. Indeed, the modern observer is struck by the capacity of medieval Jews to understand accurately the changing realities of political power in the medieval world and to perceive acutely shifting economic patterns. Jews in Northern Europe were initially active as merchants, but after the first crusade of 1096, their economic activities were increasingly restricted to lending money, an essential service in a changing economy that was in need of easily transferable sources of wealth. They were encouraged to settle and generally protected by rulers because they were useful in providing larger and more flexible revenues to their overlords in the form of taxation. Where Jewish money lending business was supported and flourished, Christian resources that were otherwise inaccessible to rulers could be tapped, first by Jews through interest on loans, and then into government coffers as taxes on their profits on these loans and Jewish contributions to government treasuries in a time before general taxation were considerable. Um, and here we have a manuscript illustration of a Jewish money lender uh, with his assistant um, lending money to a Christian borrower. The elaborate record keeping required for these transactions meant that ruling authorities had extensive and accurate information on Jewish fiscal resources. Medieval governments were always strapped for funds and found it difficult to resist the lure of Jewish wealth through increasingly heavy taxation. In many places, Jews paid as much as 13% of all the taxes raised, uh, a highly disproportionate share compared to their population numbers. And essentially Jewish property, including the debts owed by Christians to the moneylender, were seen as the property of the king and could be expropriated from dead Jews or from living ones. The lure of immediate revenues sometimes moved kings such as Henry III of England in the 13th century to take everything that he could even though this meant destroying the potential for future profit. At that point, the Jews were expelled. We will see a similar situation in Blois in 1171. Ambivalence about money lending and its morality was ubiquitous among both Jews and Christians. Jews simply saw it as a necessity for survival. 
Interestingly, a French churchman, Abelard, Peter Abelard, who died in 1142, in his dialogue of a philosopher with a Jew and a Christian, put a speech of vindication in the mouth of his Jewish character who says, we are allowed to possess neither fields nor vineyards, nor any landed estates, because there is no one who can protect them for us from open or devious attack. And therefore we are forced to resort to money lending to survive. Money lending was a gender neutral profession and Jewish women were very much involved. These complex undertakings required a degree of literacy in the vernacular and training in mathematics and bookkeeping. Extant records in various European archives indicate that Jewish women acting alone or as the head of a business consortium were responsible for one half of all loans in Northern France in the 13th and 14th centuries and one third in German and Austrian communities between 1390 and 1500. Moreover, these figures do not take into account women who partnered with their husbands or a male relative. In those cases, the lender was always listed in official records as the male partner. Although most women dealt in small loans to other women, to Christian women, small groups, usually widows, were active in major business transactions with nobility and rulers. The highly successful Licoritia of Winchester had direct dealings with the King of England and her five sons who described themselves as the sons of Licoritia were also money lenders continuing their mother's business after her murder in, 1220, in 1277. Money lending, especially by single women was a dangerous profession. A little a word on these slides. The images on the last on this slide and the previous one date from 1233 during the reign of Henry III of England. They were found on an exchequer roll. That is a government document recording the tax payments by Jews in the city of Norwich in Norfolk, a very important city at that time. The caricatures represent at the top um, Isaac, uh, Isaac Phil Jurnet, a Jewish moneylender who owned a large amount of property in the city and was a banker to the king, and uh, two of his Jewish employees who connected payments for him. On the previous side, we see this man Moses Moke on the left and a woman named Abigail. And between them is the devil with hellfires behind him. Um, I could say a lot more about these images, but for now, just pointing out uh, that Jews are seen as creatures of the devil, uh, both male and female. And of course, they are portrayed with uh, caricatured stereotyped features. Here's a map of France around 1170. Um, France in the 12th century was fragmented into various semi-independent duchies and counties. A significant portion, everything on the map in orange or different shades of orange was effectively under the rule of England. Uh, France in this era had a lack of stability and this is reflected in the perilous and precarious situation of Jews in these territories. The area in blue is area under the uh, control, we can say, of the King of France, although uh, the territory consists of various duchies, each with its own ruler. Here we see uh, the Duchy of Blois, um, and very much on the border with Anjou, uh, which was part of the territory of the Angevin kings, uh, the Plantagenet family. So uh, things were pretty complicated in France, in what we call France in the 12th and into the 13th century. Okay, uh, here's just another map showing Loire River Valley or Lyon up here, Blois, Tour, 
um, Angers over here. Here's a photograph I took when I was in Blois uh, two years ago. In fact, there's not much of medieval Blois left, although they seem to be making some efforts to um, bring the old medieval section um, back to life. It's a Loire river city, um, very important in the Middle Ages um, because it was a center of commerce. Okay, so um, here I have a little bit of information on the Count and Countess of Loire in 1171. And um, it's actually important uh, for several reasons. Um, okay, so the Count of Blois is named Thibault or Theobald V, 1130 to 1191. Interestingly, he died in the land of Israel at Akko or Acre on crusade. Um, his second wife was Alex of France, a daughter of Louis VII of France, 1120 to 1180, and Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, the marriages among the French nobility were really complex. Louis VII married Eleanor of Aquitaine, who controlled a huge amount of territory um, in southern France, but they only had daughters. Uh, in the course of their marriage, they had two daughters, and the king was very anxious for his son. So he had the marriage with Eleanor and Nald, and Eleanor went on to marry Henry II, uh, the Plantagenet King of England, um, with whom she had several sons and daughters. Interestingly, Louis then married again, and that wife also only had daughters, and only with his third marriage did he finally succeed in having a son. Meanwhile, Tybalt's first marriage also did not yield uh, any sons. He's remarried to Alex in 1174. His first child with Alex is a daughter. His son is only born in 1172. And I say all this because it's going to play a role. And if any of you who've read the uh, books by Hilary Montel about Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII, um, Wolf Hall is the first of the three, know how important having a son was for these kings and rulers who see themselves as ruling by divine right, directly authorized by God, and whether or not they had a son is seen in some way as a measure of their, um, their rightness their, uh, in the divine um, gaze. Okay, Pochelina of Blois. And here's how her name is spelled um, in the Hebrew text. Um, interesting. And her name may seem very exotic to us, but we've already heard about Licorizia of Winchester. So we have a clue that Jewish girls, Jewish baby girls, were often given quite exotic names, uh, romance uh, names, uh, Belle Asse, Urania, um, I'm going blank, of course, Richenza, but um, very pretty names from the uh, secular, the mainstream language. That's more unusual for boys who often have Hebrew names, but it indicates that the spoken language for Jews in Ashkenaz was um, the vernacular, the everyday language um, of the people among whom they lived. So Pochelina, and her name also was sometimes rendered in English, with Polchelina with an O or Puchelina without the L, was likely a widow in business, money lending with her two daughters. Her name probably derives from the old French Pucelle, meaning a maiden. She was a prominent money lender in 12th century Lebois uh, in the court ruled by Count Thibault V. And we know she had a close relationship with Thibault and extensive financial dealings with other members of the court, including the countess and her ladies. The exact nature of her bond with Thibault has been much discussed over the centuries, and I will return to it shortly. In 1171, Pochelina and her two daughters and, and as many as 30 other Jews of the approximately 40 Jews in the city 
were burned at the stake. The victims included religious scholars and uh, leaders, and 17 or 18 of those murdered were women. The remaining Jews, mostly children, were forcibly converted to Christianity. Tybalt was encouraged by a cleric from, an, from the Augustinian order uh, to, um, to execute the Jews. And they were justified, um, and he justified these horrific executions as punishment for the Jews' purported murder of a Christian boy. Although the Hebrew sources state that no missing child was reported, nor was any body ever found. Although an attempt to ransom the Jews of the city and prevent the execution was unsuccessful, apparently the amount of money offered was too little, um, Jews in neighboring communities subsequently raised significant sums for secular and ecclesiastical rulers to guarantee perfection of the remaining Jews in the larger precincts of the duchy of the law, and ultimately to have the murdered Jews, the children who had been forcibly converted to Christianity, return to the community. Chazen has written in detail about the ways in which the nearby Jewish communities, galvanized by the leadership of Rabbi Jacob Tom, known as Rabbeinu Tom, the grandson of the commentator Rashi and leader of Northern French Jewry, responded to this horrible event through an extensive campaign of lobbying the king in Paris and other regional leaders and churchmen to denounce what happened at Blois, which they did, and to provide security against any recurrence. Um, I'll digress just for a moment with a few words on allegations known as ritual murder accusations or blood libels. The first occurred in England in Norwich in 1144, when a 12 year old boy's body, a body of a 12 year old boy was found in the forest and his death was blamed on the Jews, a number of whom were arrested. In this instance, despite clerical pressure, the sheriff of the city who represented the king refused to prosecute on the grounds that the Jews were the king's men and not subject to church authority. <clears throat> and also because there was no evidence against them. William's death was later portrayed um, as an imitation of the crucifixion. And eventually these charges came to include claims that Jews murdered a Christian boy in a ritual manner, often echoing the crucifixion and used his blood for some religious or ritual purpose, such as making Passover matzah. Um, related to such accusations are similar claims beginning later in the 13th century that Jews desecrated the Eucharist wafer, the body of Christ. And the events uh, of William of Norwich's uh, purported um, martyrdom are recounted in a highly prejudicial and credulous way by a cleric named Thomas of Monmouth in 1173 in his Life and Miracles of St. William of Norwich, a book with an enormous impact. And despite the fact that the Jews are declared innocent in Norwich, the accusation quickly spreads in England and um, throughout Europe. Generally, these boys were uh, claimed to be saints and miracles were attributed to them. And of course, the cathedral in the city where the event purportedly happened became a major shrine which brought significant revenue to the cathedral and the town. So these are complicated events. Uh, for those who are interested, um, here's a little bit of recent scholarship on William of Norwich. Um, which um, probably will be most people, useful to people um, who look at the recorded version. But I will say that there's enormous interest 
in scholarship on ritual murder um, going on in the present, not only in the medieval, but also the early modern period in um, Northern, in Germany and in Poland. And as we know, there was um, even such a case in the United States at the beginning of the 20th century. And this uh, libel continues to be, um, to be spread from time to time. Um, here, by the way, is uh, from a German work, 14th century, the Nuremberg Chronicle, Liber Chronicarum, of the burning of the Jews of Strasbourg um, in the 14th century, um, when they were accused of poisoning the wells and causing um, the bubonic plague. And you see the um, Jews include both um, men and women. Okay. So the Blois event is sometimes considered one of the earliest instances in continental Europe of a ritual murder accusation. But in fact, it diverges significantly from almost all other examples. While such accusations became most common around Passover and Easter, this was not the case in Blois where the allegations were made in May nor were any ritual claims part of the initial accusation. Uh, no cult of sainthood arose around the supposed murdered child. In fact, there never was any identified victim. Moreover, what makes the Blois event unique is that this was the first occasion in which, in which Jews were not only arrested, but actually murdered by a secular ruler in response to the accusation. Scholars have written that the allegation of ritualized Jewish murder is in fact part of a growing medieval perception beginning in the 12th century that Jews hated their Christian neighbors so passionately that they would take advantage of any opportunity to harm them. He calls this willingness of major authorities and particularly in this case, to involve themselves in anti-Jewish violence, quote, a harbinger of some of the dangers that were to afflict early Ashkenazic Jewry at this critical juncture in time, and eventually to sap it of its vigor and strength. Oh, back, back one, sorry. Okay. The events at Blois appear to have been a money grab by Thibault to eliminate bothersome debts to Jewish lenders, seize Jewish wealth, and remove Jews from his county altogether. These goals certainly were achieved, and it's worth looking at his motives in more detail. Recent scholarship suggests that Thibault's actions are best understood in a political and economic context that relates directly to developments in the Kingdom of France. Emily Rose has written that the Blois burnings served multiple purposes for Thibault. They reinforced his hold on a county that was overshadowed on all sides by wealthier towns with competing loyalties. Blois was a small and poor duchy compared to its neighbors. Uh, they served to raise urgently needed funds for the count and his wife. They eliminated the contentious source of power, Pochelina in the small county, and they celebrated and reinforced Thibault V as a most Christian count, silencing any rumors involving his ritual impurity as a result of his failure to father a male heir. And this is why I stressed earlier the importance for these rulers of having a male child, um, that it could be seen as a sign from God of impurity or other unfitness on the part of the ruler. So Tybalt had a lot of motivations, although I would uh, put the financial one um, at the top. Indeed, Robert of Tortigny, uh, 1180 to 1186, who was abbot of Mont Saint Michel Abbey in Normandy, in a revisionist and defamatory account of these events in the uh, Gesta Normanorum Ducum, the deeds of the Norman dukes, um, highlights Thibault's religious fervor, writing that he burned the Jews of Blois 
because they had crucified a Christian boy at Easter in order to mark their contempt for Christians and that they were condemned to death only after the body which the Jews had thrown into the Loire was discovered. So you see that already uh, by the 1180s, all of the missing elements from the Christian point of view are added. It took place at Easter. The Jews have contempt for Christians. The body, the Jew, there was a body which was crucified and the Jews threw it into the Loire from which it was um, recovered. It is important, um, and here's just uh, again, some of the recent scholarship for those who are interested. It is important to point out that Tybalt was acting on his own. His extraordinary actions were not supported by his older brother, Henri, the Count of Champagne, his younger brother, Guillaume, Bishop of the Diocese of Sens and Chartres, or indeed by his father-in-law, Louis VII, the King of France. All three of these authorities, in response to Jewish lobbying and gifts, denounced the accusation and supported the innocence of the murdered Jews, if unfortunately after the murders have, themselves had already occurred. Okay. The Hebrew documents related to this tragedy are unusually extensive. They include a series of five letters written by various French Jewish communities in its immediate aftermath. The first of these, the Orléans letter, includes a moving elegy for the victims, a review of the events leading up to the tragedy. <clears throat> a letter from Paris describes negotiations with King Louis VII uh, for the protection of Jewish life and property. Another letter discusses negotiations with Guillaume, Bishop of Sons and Chartres, for ransom of captives and converts. And uh, the other letters also um, declare a commemorative day of fasting and exalt the courage of the martyrs. In addition to the letters, there is a chronicle by Ephraim of Bonn, Sefer Zichira, written in the 1190s and um, a list of the martyrs in a, in a book known as the Nuremberg Memorbuch and eight liturgical poems, um, which I will not deal with at all today, but is an interesting topic in itself. Um, this unusually plentiful literary output and its preservation testifies to the profound impact the mass martyrdom had on the Jews of Northern France and Germany. Okay. <clears throat> I will note, and we'll come back to this, that in the Orléans letter, Pochalina, who is not named, is described as an arrogant woman or a harsh woman who acted arrogantly towards the town's people with the co-sanction of the Duke and dealt heavily with all who came to her, including the countess and her ladies. Nevertheless, according to the letter, the count, Ohav, loved or favored her. And uh, the documents, uh, translations, et cetera, um, they'll be able to reference this information in the recorded um, version. Okay. Um, among other content, the Orléans letter provides a narrative about the events that precipitated the arrests. The writer relates that a Christian servant reported that he had seen um, a Jew, sorry, that he had seen a Jew throwing a boy's body into the river at twilight. In fact, the Jew was washing untanned hides. Jews were very involved in the tanning industry. This Jew had purchased hides and was bringing them back to the city and was probably washing them off. He came, the servant reported this to the employer who, had, who saw an opportunity as we see in the excerpt here. Now you be silent, the employer says to the servant, this is the day I have longed for. Since the Jewish woman said such and such to me, she ill-treated me, so I will do to her. 
And it goes on to say that she was an arrogant woman, dealt harshly with all who came before her, including the countess and her new tricks. Uh, in Hebrew, we have the word for nurse, probably means her lady in waiting, her chief lady in waiting, and the townspeople plotted to undermine her. Um, even when she was arrested, it says she remained unfettered because of her special relationship uh, with the Duke, with the Count, sorry. Uh, she was held in the tower along with all the other Jews. She could speak with anyone she wished except the Count himself because she did not believe the Count's heart was ill inclined towards her. All those days he had loved them greatly which I take to mean the Jews, how could he, um, how could he turn against her now? Nothing else is known about the woman in the initial account beyond the fact that she and her two daughters are listed at the end of the Orléans letter among the other martyrs. She was likely a widow who uh, ran a money lending business with her daughters. There's no account of any husbands or sons um, nor is it possible to know the nature of her relationship with Thibault, beyond the fact that they worked closely together, likely based on shared profits from her economic transactions. In fact, one could read the Orléans letter, its depiction of this woman as harsh and unforgiving in her business practices, as an attempt to explain the hostility of the Blois Jews I'm sorry, the Blois Christian community toward the Jews in general. Chazen has written up the letter, Jewish readers had to be informed about the details in order to show everyone that the Jews who perished were entirely innocent, that the basis for the tragedy lay in the wickedness of Count Theobald, transformed by the incitement of an irresponsible priest, that the relationship engaged in Pipotolina especially when intensified by her high-handedness, bore the seeds of disaster, and that the Jews of Blois at the moment of crisis accepted upon themselves the mantle of martyrdom. Chazen refers to the relationship between Thibault and Pocholina as amorous, um, but this remains to be seen. But I agree with Chazen that she is being blamed in this letter for helping to incite the events that followed. This is supported by the inclusion in the Orléans letter of an otherwise unrelated and seemingly irrelevant incident involving Jews in the neighboring town of Lorsch, where a boy desired to marry a young girl. A Jewish boy wanted to marry a Jewish girl, but her parents objected. He then eloped with her and informed on the parents to the Christian authorities, um, something made up, resulting in, their, uh, <laughs> resulting in their arrest and nearly precipitating a communal disaster. What is this doing in the letter about Blois? The link seems to be that the boy's ungoverned lust led to graver antisocial acts with nearly tragic results for the community. So um, we could say the uh, arrogant woman in Blois is portrayed as acting out of personal desire or ambition and greed with fatal consequences for the community. Um, moreover, I would add that it's important to remember that the Orléans letter was written for public consumption by other Jews and not only for the Jewish communities of France, but for Christian eyes as well, for the eyes of the king. At some level, criticism is being leveled at those who do not act in the best interest of all, who do not demonstrate humility, good sense, and generosity. We might say that Pocholina is in popular parlance being thrown under the bus here. Um, and also she is a didactic model of how Jewish money lenders should behave towards their clients. That is, she is not how they should behave. Susan Einbinder, a literary scholar, has called into question long-standing assumptions about the nature of the relationship between Thibault and Pocholina. She suggests that the portrait in the 
Orleans letter is of a tough businesswoman who created resentment because of her unforgiving business practices. She was harsh, Keshat Ruach, with Christians, including the Countess and the Countess's ladies. She dealt heavily with all who came before her. Vatin Hag Bechvedut in Kalba Eha. These are hardly descriptions of a romantic figure who has beguiled the local ruler with her charms. Rather, Einbinder persuasively argues that the woman trusts in the Count because she and he have a profitable partnership. And he had always up till that time been well disposed towards them, that is the Jewish community who provided so much of his income. She argues that the use of the verb ahav in this context should be read, read as favored or loyal to, that it implies a quasi-feudal bond of patronage or loyal devotion. That is, Puchelina trusted in the Count's feudal loyalty because he had honored his obligations towards the Jews up to that point. Her fault, according to the Orléans letter, was not an inappropriate sexual liaison with the Count, Rather, she did not show sufficient goodwill to her clients and therefore caused problems that were ultimately catastrophic for the Jews. In many ways, this is a classic court Jew scenario, a theme I will return to um, in a moment. In Sefer Zichira, an historical account of the persecutions that befell the Jews of Ashkenaz from the First Crusade of 1096 to the late 1890s, the chronicler and poet Ephraim of Bonn, uh, who died in 1200, also recounts the events at Blois. He depends a great deal in his description on the Orléans letters, but he does name the protagonist as Madame so-and-so, Madame Pochelina. Um, interestingly, he eliminates most of the negative references to this arrogant character and uh, tough woman. And by doing so, he reshapes this prominent figure while minimizing her political power. Ephraim recasts Pochelina as a religious and romantic heroine who, quote, exhorts her people like the biblical Esther and strives to intercede on their behalf. Moreover, he introduces a new villain. And this villain is the Count's wife, uh, who he calls Jezebel. But Jezebel, his wife, uh, pervaded uh, with him because she too hated Madame Pochelina. Now, all of them, that is the Jews, were in chains except for her, but the Count's servants would not let her speak to the Count at all, lest she changed his mind. Most subsequent readers of Ephraim have understood him to be referring to a sexual relationship between Pochelina and the Count. But again, a close reading undermines that opinion. Uh, again, Ephraim uses Ohav here and elsewhere in his chronicle to, you, to mean uh, favored um, or trusted. Ephraim's discomfort with Pochelina is reflected in the ways he suggests her activities and arrogance created friction, friction, whether with Jews or Christians, but he softens this portrayal once her freedom of movement is curtailed. His adaptations mark the beginning of the process that would culminate in a romanticized and sexualized reading of Pochelina. And he adds this new element of uh, the uh, Count's wife, Alex, who's characterized as a Jezebel. Her hatred supported by the Augustinian churchmen will bring about the moneylender's downfall and murder of the Jewish community um, of Blois. In the Chronicle, um, Ephraim depicts Pochelina and the Countess as foils. 
Pouch Alina encourages the Jews and trusts in the Count, while the Countess incites and hates. Moreover, the Count himself mostly acts negatively. He doesn't know, he had no evidence, he didn't turn to the Jews, he didn't listen. His only positive action is to open negotiations for ransom, but he is prevented in negotiating by the Augustinian cleric. Jewish literary representations of Pochelina, her privileged position, her downfall and the attendant consequences continued to evolve over time. What a reappearing theme, which we already get a hint of in Ephraim Sefer Zechira is the motif of the court Jew. This pattern, which originates in biblical figures such as Joseph and Esther, was reiterated in real life during the medieval and modern period. Uh, first of all, in Spain with the various court Jews who served Muslim and then Christian rulers, and uh, later particularly in the 18th century in German-speaking Europe. Although the historical Pauchelina achieved an important economic role in the highest circles of Blois through her entrepreneurial success and financial acumen as did most court Jews historically, her later representations were shaped by her gender and she was reduced to an object of desire said to have a sexual liaison with a powerful Gentile ruler. In this, she is similar to the biblical Esther. In the case of Pauchelina, however, the story does not have a happy ending. In Emet Ha Baha, the Valley of Tears, Joseph HaKohen, uh, who lived in, most of his life in Italy, transformed Pauchelina into a woman of valor. who was explicitly involved in a romance with Count Tybalt. When the Jews were arrested for killing a child, the Count arrested all of them. When the Jews of Loire were, I'm sorry, although Pochelina continued to trust in Tybalt's affection, Joseph writes that Countess Alex diverted him and spoke hatefully of the Jews. Then the woman Pochelina was not pleasing to him and he hated her greatly. And we can see an echo here as well of the biblical story of Amnon, son of David's rejection of his half-sister Tamar um, after he had raped her in 2 Samuel. Um, modern historians um, have been more than willing to accept Pochelina's role as a woman foolishly enmeshed in a futile and ultimately fatal romantic, represent, <laughs> romantic relationship with Count Tybalt. Um, and later representations of Pochelina are typical of how Jewish poetry and prose romanticized real figures uh, into idealized figurations. Um, and, and um, I agree with um, Susan Einbinder, who has argued that the original woman, if she was even named Pauchelina, does not appear to have been involved in any kind of romance, simply that through her business abilities, she has formed a business relationship with enormous benefits for the cash-strapped um, count, and that he saw greater financial opportunities by um, killing all of the Jews and seizing their goods. Um, I have written, um, as have others, about the ways in which Jewish women's financial power uh, begins to fade uh, as the Middle Ages progress. Women in the 11th and 12th and into the early 13th century often were the major wage earners, they were the entrepreneurs, the money lenders who supported their families, particularly when they became widows, they um, pressed for ritual opportunities, they asserted their authority in Jewish communities through their financial heft, um, so that community leaders and even rabbis had to accede sometimes to the wishes of the wealthiest women. We begin to see this 
fading um, as conditions for Jews deteriorate in the 13th century and afterwards. And I think in the transformations of Pochelina from the canny uh, financial entrepreneur who had a trusted relationship with the count to this um, romantic figure um, and to the woman as um, sexual, um, sexually attractive, um, we see, um, we see a, a, tr a transformation and a uh, process. Um, this tragedy, and here we have uh, in the 19th century, La Belle Juive, uh, the um, theme that becomes very popular in uh, Christian uh, thinking and art, the, um, the beautiful Jewess um, who entices Christian men. Here we have Sarah, Barn uh, Sarah Bernhardt, um, the actress, um, but there are many other models. I actually tried to see if I could get an image from the uh, film of Ivanhoe with um, Elizabeth Taylor, where Elizabeth plays the um, Jewish Rebecca, who ultimately as a woman of valor uh, rejects in Sir Walter Scott's novel, Ivanhoe, uh, the Christian Ivanhoe and casts her uh, fate and future with the Jewish people. Um, and this obviously became a, uh, a comfortable image. Interestingly, in 1927, Shlomo Dov Goitan, who would go on to become the preeminent scholar of his time of the Cairo Geniza documents, in which he uh, gives a lot of attention to Jewish businesswomen, wrote a play in Hebrew called Polzalina. This drama drew on Ephraim of Bond's Chronicle, as well as Hebrew liturgical poems by Ephraim and his brother Hillel, as well as other versions. In the play, Goitan depicts Posel Pochelina as both a fearsome businesswoman and a model of piety who led prayers for other women in captivity. Yet she is also sexualized as highly attractive to men, even as she resists their advances. And we can see here remnants of the uh, 19th century La Belle Juive, as well as I mentioned, uh, Sir Walter Scott's Rebecca in Ivanhoe, who by the way was said to have been based on the beautiful Rebecca Grotz of um, Philadelphia, the um, late 18th and early 19th uh, century Jewish woman um, who herself um, never married and was obviously seen as a fascinating figure by Christian men um, who met her. Okay, so to conclude, takeaways. Um, what do we learn here? All right, we learn that Jews in medieval Europe were totally dependent on the secular ruler's goodwill, which they generally maintained as we've th seen through charters and economic services. They were also at the mercy of greater forces that had little to do with their own actions, as in the case of the Crusades, when the mass of uh, marauding uh, crusaders overwhelmed local authorities, both secular and religious, or in the case of the Black Death, uh, the pandemic when all social order dissolved and Jews were blamed for the illness. Nevertheless, Jews had a need to find reasonable explanations for irrational events. And I didn't read you the elegy from early on, but it begins with a lamenting of the imagined communal sins of the Jews, which had brought the, this horrific tragedy upon them. And we find this in Crusader, in the Crusade Chronicles as well, that in a realm, uh, in a earthly realm reigned by divine justice, that catastrophe must have a human cause, whether of the community or individual wrongdoing, as in the um, wrongdoings of Pochelina, or reenactments of divinely ordained um, biblical patterns, as in the case of Joseph in Egypt or Esther in Persia. We also learn that it is impossible to know very much about the real Pochelina. Even her name is suspect. The original Orleans letter doesn't give her a name. 
Ephraim does 20 years after the event. Did he know it or did he invent it? And the Hebrew accounts themselves, even as to the events, un are unreliable. As with all literary works, they are shaping the narrative for particular purposes. In this case, to emphasize the innocence of the Jews, possible uh, causes, and um, particularly to present a case um, to the um, Christians who might be reading these letters. And finally, narratives about Pochelina demonstrate an increasing Jewish discomfort with successful independent women, a trend that increases over time in Ashkenaz. This led to her literary transformation from a complex, difficult, real woman into a, sep into a sexual object, ultimately rejected by a Gentile lover, or into a woman of valor who rejects conversion and dies with her people. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, there are a few questions. Um, I stopped your share so that we can see your answer. Um, mm -hmm. Elena asked, were there any ever accusations of Jews killing Christian girls? Um, no. Uh, no, because um, the boy was so important because, of course, he is Christ. So that killing the Christian child is reenacting the crucifixion. Um, and I don't know, I think I mentioned, but I'm not sure that, yeah, that later on in the 13th century, uh, we also have the added accusation of desecration of the Eucharist wafer, where Jews would steal the wafer from churches and take them into the wood and stab the Eucharist wafer with knives or urinate on it. And then the wafer would turn into a male infant because of course the wafer is the body of Christ. So um, we do have stories where um, the Jew um, encouraging or seducing the Christian boy is a young woman, the Jew's daughter, who encounters him and entices him and delivers him into the hands of the Jewish men uh, who perform the crucifixion. Thank you very much. Um, Rishona asked, what protective measures would Jews commonly take in anticipation of such events erupting at any given time? Um, the protective measures, of course, would be trying to keep the rulers as happy as possible with money, with revenues. And the first recourse in the case of anything like this was to appoint an intermediary, someone who had experience with Christians, particularly at a high level, who could go as a negotiator to try to work something out. As in the case of William of Norwich, uh, there would have been a Jewish negotiator who would have gone to the sheriff and possibly even um, alerted other important Jews in London to, um, to try to make contact with the king. And with these negotiations, there would be generous gifts that would accompany the negotiators. So the basic recourse would be economic, financial. And really the big mistake in Blois was that they didn't offer enough at the beginning. Um, and also it may never have been enough. Um, Theobald did end up getting another thousand gold pieces by promising not to persecute the other Jews in his, in his duchy or in his county. Thank you very much. Um, Alex asked, uh, did money lenders typically use their own private funds or did they recruit uh, silent partners and investors to increase their assets? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is absolutely that they formed consortia. One of the Jewish women I've done a great deal of work on is Dolce of Worms, who in fact was murdered just a little bit after this in Germany in 1197. Uh, her husband was uh, Rabbi Eliezer ben Judah of Worms the Rokeach, a great scholar um, and mystic connected with the uh, Hasidei Ashkenaz, the school of Jewish pietists. And she supported the family by running a consortia in which 
Um, others, men and women, would contribute money. Clearly, certain individuals might have been seen as being more talented in dealing with non-Jews, and then she would put that money out um, to earn interest from which everyone in the group would benefit, and then, of course, the Christian authorities. It's interesting, the exchequer roles, I showed you um, that illustration that some clerk had made in the exchequer roles of the Jews, Jewish moneylenders and the devil. The earliest, they're the earliest financial records that survived from England. In other words, the most important transactions that were going on that had to be recorded were those between the king and the king's representatives and Jewish lenders, since they were such a major source of revenue. So I guess we'd say that the Jews played a role in um, helping to uh, form the bureaucracy of the uh, states of medieval Europe. And when Jews made loans, uh, also they would uh, not only make um, records of the loans in, um, in vernacular and Hebrew script, but they would also have to go to a Christian notary to um, have a record made of the loan in Latin to make sure that the rulers were um, informed about all of the transactions in order to, to, in order to tax them. Thank you very much. Um, there was a whole conversation going on uh, in the chat room uh, regarding the, the cause and, and reason for all this. So Julie wrote, Jealous, jealousy uh, because we, were, uh, we could read and write as women. And then GE writes, uh, sounds like superstition too. Most men were illiterate and almost all women, and almost all women fear as well as envy. And then um, there was another comment, uh, I think by Sarah. Sounds like it was a, a posthumous smear campaign against uh, um, uh, that, the woman. I don't want to mispronounce her name, I'm sorry, uh, Pulsila. Pulsalina. Pulsalina. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, we have no idea whether or not she was arrogant, etc. Wasn't this just an attempt to, to protect the community uh, from further attacks? Wasn't this blaming the victim? Yes. You know, as I said, throwing her under the bus. Um, yes. Who can we blame? Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. Let's start with Christians. Jews, as I said, were a real problem to the church because they did constitute these small middle-class groups in a feudal society where most people were uh, employed as serfs in agriculture. And even in towns where a middle-class was beginning to form, they would be seen as rivals, as rival merchants with Christian merchants and um, even as rival money lenders. Nobody should imagine that Christians weren't lending money also. In fact, the abbeys were big lenders of money. Everyone needed money, everyone was lending it. But there was a lot of envy and resentment of the Jews. Christian women like Countess Alex uh, and her sister, the uh, Countess of Champagne and Marie, um, were highly educated. Uh, they were the daughters of Eleanor of Aquitaine, and they spread culture and courtly romance across France. So women of equivalent financial standing, which would be women of the nobility and maybe the higher bourgeoisie, were educated. But um, nevertheless, the educated Jewish women who dealt with poor Christian women, generally Jewish women lent to women and Jews lent to people of similar social status. So the wealthiest Jews like Pochelina would lend to the count, the poorest Jewish women would lend to poor Jewish women, but they would have to have some, uh, some literacy and some numeracy. You don't apply compound interest, you know, that increases weekly without having pretty good math skills. Um, so I'm sure there was envy. And also, let's face it, the Jews were middle class. They had nice houses. The oldest stone house in um, Lincoln in England, Aaron of Lincoln, you know, they had nicer houses, partly for protection. They were strong. They dressed nicely. Rabbis are always imposing sumptuary laws on Jewish community. Don't dress too well. Don't wear jewelry in public. Don't do things to incite the um, envy of, of the Christians. And of course, the church was always teaching that Jews were subservient, inferior. Um, and if you have wealthy Jews evident in the community, um, that's a problem. 
Now, within the Jewish community itself, certainly there was a lot of resentment by men towards women who achieved high positions, um, as I've said, and real efforts beginning in the 13th century to clamp down. It's a whole other topic, but the whole issue of women uh, obtaining divorces in various ways in Ashkenaz from about the 10th to the 13th century and rabbinic efforts to prevent them um, indicates the annoyance that, shall we say, uppity women caused um, to rabbinic authority. So um, always easiest to uh, blame it on, on the woman. Thank you. There was another comment that I missed uh, earlier to, to read in the same regard. Uh, Elena wrote, um, Jewish women were at the best uh, literate and vernacular, not Hebrew or even more so Latin, as witnessed by Yiddish prayer books, specifically uh, for the use of women and simple men, quote unquote. Uh, no reason to en for envy there. Rather, pogroms were, were uh, caused by Christians unwilling to pay their debts to moneylenders. Yes, um, often another reason, um, and again, I want to make a differentiation between Eastern Europe beginning, you know, uh, where Ashkenaz, the Jews move east, it's a different situation there. But um, there were certainly attacks in York, for instance, um, on Jewish communities where much of the motivation was to, to burn the rolls of debt. It's one of the reasons why the king um, insisted, the rulers insisted on, in effect, a double system of bookkeeping where Christian authorities kept records as well, so that even if the crowd burned Jewish records, the, uh, the rulers would still have records of the debts uh, to make sure that they collected. In effect, Jewish money lending provided a form of taxation for um, the Christian authorities, which they didn't otherwise have. The Jews made their money and then the Christian authorities taxed it and um, taxed it excessively. They used to say in England, the Jews were the king's milk cow. Um, yes, I do just wanna say though that the situation in the territories we're talking about in this period was different from pogroms in Eastern Europe um, later on beginning in the um, 1600s, but with the same result that you got killed. Thank you very much. I don't much. know if I answered that fully. I don't know if I remembered every detail there. Absolutely. Um, Sarah suggested we follow the money and asked where did all of uh, where did all of Pulcilina's uh, money go end up? Sorry. Um, it would have ended up going um, to the king. In other words, when um, whenever the king wanted, he could he could expel the Jews and seize their resources. So the treaties that they had um, were only lasted as long as the king wanted them to last. These charters could be canceled at any time. And um, the king could either, as in England, uh, bankrupt the Jews by taxing them more and more heavily until uh, they no longer had anything left. That's the king's milk cow. And then this was Henry III. And then after he died, his son, Edward I, at the end of the, um, in 1290 simply expelled all the Jews from England since they no longer were useful. And similarly in France in the um, 14th century, Jews begin to be expelled when they no longer, when the king has other sources of revenue and they no longer are useful. He can simply cancel the charter and kick them out. Thank you very much. Um, there are many thank yous in the chat and also uh, uh, many compliments. Uh, one you. of them I would just like to read out uh, is by uh, Beth, and she says, thank you. I wish that my advisor from grad school uh, could hear or read this. You've presented an interesting perspective on gender. Um, and Irv wrote, um, were the victims buried by the surrounding Jewish communities? Okay, this was a real issue. One of the requests in one of the five letters written after the event, the letter that was written to the archbishop um, requested proper burial. Uh, the trouble was that the Jews were immolated. You know, they were burned at the stake and it's unclear what kind of remains and it is unclear whether or not that request was granted. It certainly was very much something 
that the Jews wanted. They wanted to bury such remains as they were in it. In this case, it is unclear if the um, archbishop, who was also the brother of uh, the um, of of uh, our, our friend the Count Tybalt, um, gave in, or whether there was anything to remain by the time the request was made. But excellent question. Thank you very very much. Um... I don't see any more questions here, but uh, I will absolutely uh, uh, send you the transcript, the chat transcript, so you could uh, see all the all the wonderful compliments and thank yous that are here. I'm also gonna um, turn the microphones on, release the microphones so that people can say thank you and ask any more questions that might uh, uh, we've we, I might have skipped over, and I apologize if so. Thank you so so much, Professor. Uh, have a wonderful night or wonderful day by you. And we'll <laughs> yeah, see you all in our next here. events. <laughs> Thank you. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Where are you? I am in Eugene, Oregon. Ah, OK. You are wonderful. The letters on the sword were Arabic in the picture? Um, no, I don't think so. But um, they don't may have been. Yeah, I'll look at it. They may have been some kind of effort to make it look like Arabic. To, uh, because often I think in the medieval mind in Ashkenaz, the Jews become the available enemy since the Muslims are, are not. You know, in a way they're a substitute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, you are wonderful. Thank you very much. You have a wonderful voice. Thank you, Thank you very much. The photographs behind you, could you talk about those just for oh, a second? Ha, ha. Okay, um, three of them are photographs of, um, two of them of Oregon, one of them is in Arizona by a local photographer named Gary. <laughs> he actually has uh, provided photographs for UNICEF cards in the past. Um, what else do I have back here? I have a print by my late uncle Leonard Baskin, who was a oh. graphic artist and sculptor. And on the other side, I have a Japanese print. Um, so just some Thank of the- Thank you, beautiful. Thank you. Um, I wondered if the, the Hebrew letters that you referred to, if the uh, intended uh, audience included Christians, were they translated into old French when they were disseminated? Yeah, good question. My guess would be yes. Mm -hmm. That they would have been written, of course, in Hebrew. Um, yeah. but translated um, for the rulers, there would have been versions in, in um, French, um, which reminds me about Jewish women. Of course, um, they did not, they were almost never taught Hebrew. They would have been taught um, a vernacular old Yiddish, I suppose we would call it, which they wrote in Hebrew characters. Um, Jews always wrote the vernacular, whatever it was, whether it was well, as we know, Yiddish or, you know, a Franco-Yiddish or a German Yiddish or an Italian Yiddish, they always wrote it in Hebrew characters, but women were rarely taught Hebrew. Can I ask, please, how closely connected communities with been in France and England would they have known about what was happening? They would have been, yeah, go ahead. Yes, they would have been very closely connected. The community in England only establishes itself in 1066 after the Norman conquest where they obviously see economic opportunity and um, they would have been related to and stayed in um, close contact with um, the Jews in France. So they would right. have known what was happening. In yes, very shortly afterwards, so letters. So yeah. So by 1190, when all the massacres happened in Britain, yes. they would have yes. been forewarned. They would have thought they might have learned something. This the people who went to Richard's the Second's coronation. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um it was a tricky job being a Jew in medieval Ashkenaz. Hi, I, I, I'm interested. I thought the illustrations were fascinating. I was wondering whether you ever give any talks on just the the woodcuts and the illustrations, like depicting the history. It's really, really interesting to look at. Um, I don't, although I was interested way back in the day in the 70s when I was in graduate school, but I couldn't do anything. But um, 
there, um, yes, of course, I got, immediately went blank on her name. Um, there are one or two scholars who do focus on images of the Jews in, in medieval Ashkenazic art. Um, oh my gosh, I'm so, I feel terrible. I just can't um, remember right now. Um, Oh, probably if you went online and did. Oh no, I, 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 I've, I've seen some, but in yeah. term, I've been looking into Haggadahs. That, I was interested, your Baskin was, I think, illustrated a Haggadah yes, that I've just looked did. at. That was Is my that, uncle, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's amazing. But the, the illustrations you. showing how the Jews were persecuted and how they were rounded up and killed and things, that's not the kind of thing that you look at when you see I'm like, I'm looking at Haggadahs and, and yes. things like that. This is You're history more than just Jewish, religious. Jewish illustrations. But yeah, we see the more negative ones in Christian works, of course. And Thank I, you so I, much. Yes. It was wonderful. Oh. You're welcome. I just want to say my uncle is now deceased, but his older brother, my father, is now 101. Oh, a no tired way. Rabbi. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Very fortunate. Can you give a little background on the Jewish hat? the source of the shape and where it was originally used. Yeah, um, in the um, Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, Pope Innocent III um, began instituting rules to distinguish Jews from Christians in various ways, which in indicates that they weren't that distinguished in terms of appearance or dress. And among the things that they instituted were distinctive headgear or badges, yellow badges that Jews wore, or even that Jewish women had to wear one red shoe and one black shoe, but in some way had to be um, distinguished. That hat, and I don't know a lot about it, but I think it's meant to be derogatory. You know, it's somehow connected with maybe even demons or witches hats, you know, as it's come down to us, but it was meant to be distinguishing and to be a, a negative thing. I have some, some, some sort of memory of, of it even predating Europe and going back to Persia, and then they made it official, but I, I just, it's been a long time. Yeah, no, I have to say I'm not expert, but I, we certainly see pictures of Persians in, in hats like that. Yeah, it would be a good, a good study. And maybe I knew once, but unfortunately, I don't remember. <laughs> the Muslims were supposed to wear black clothing in Europe to distinguish them from uh, other uh, religions. And that's why the Jews didn't wear black. Thank you. Yes, the fact that people have to wear distinguishing markers indicates that they all look pretty much the same. Professor? Yes. Professor, th thank you very much for a very informative lecture. A um, couple questions. Will there be a bibliography available for the books that you cited in the lecture? Well, the books that I cited are um, going to be on when you look at, if you get a recording of the lecture, I do have two inserts or three inserts where I have some of the most recent scholarship. Um, okay, indicated. Sure. Thank you. And uh, did the Jews have any presence in the uh, the troubadour tradition, or did they? Actually, have... there is at least one yeah. Jewish troubadour. Was there? Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. There was a Jewish troubadour. Yes, of course. Right at this moment, I can't remember, but definitely look up Jewish troubadour on Google, and I think you'll get him. And was he pretty uh, culturally centric or did he just go with the overall troubadour type? Thing? Uh, my impression is he went with the overall uh, theme because of course his livelihood depended on being hired by various nobles to entertain. Maybe he had a repertoire for entertaining in Jewish homes. He had to please everyone, right? Yes, that's right. But maybe a wealthy Jew could have invited him and he might've had a whole other collection <clears throat> collection of songs that's such you know there's so little work still being done on, on medieval Jews of Ashkenaz um, but we knew I know of at least one so I think you can find him Thank yeah. you. Well, someone just gave some names in the chat uh, Will said Suskind von Trimberg is one yeah of that's him thank you uh, and he's the best known yeah but I see that someone Caius Wallen has listed another Bonfi. Bonfi, um, the Bonfi, or yeah. 
Yeah, so, and he got um, someone's a Jewish troubadour. Yeah, and why not? They could sing just like anyone else. <laughs> Your uncle's man of peace is here in Sacramento. I'm in Davis, uh -huh. so now I have to drive to see this. Yes, that's quite a that's quite a piece of art. Yeah, to see it in powerful. person is going to be entirely different. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I enjoyed this very much. And thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you. you very very much, Professor. We'll see you all thank at our you. next events. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Bye -bye. very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. So appreciate it. Thank you very much. Shalom.